We've finally reached that point with mini PCs where you can play a game at 1080p like The Witcher 3 at 60 frames per second. It seems unbelievable, but we're here now thanks to Strix Point from AMD, and I'm talking about the Ryzen 9 HX 370, which I've got in this mini PC. It's one of the first to have it, and I've finally got it with an unlocked BIOS, and the model is the SIR 9, or the SER 9 from them. It comes with 32 gigabytes of RAM that is configured to 7500 mega transfers, but in this video, there's quite a lengthy tutorial where I'll show you where you can tweak the RAM, overclock the RAM, overclock our CPU just a little, the GPU as well, that Radeon 890M with its 12 cores, and the power limit to tweak this to the absolute best to get that kind of performance and some amazing results as you'll see, and why I think this is probably the best mini PC that I have covered yet, but it's not perfect as you'll see in this review. B-Link does include this in the box. We have a little user manual. There's this right here, which uh, just says hello, but that's to protect and stop stuff from scratching in the inside. HDMI cable and then the charger. Now this charger, I think is a decent size and it's powerful too. This is 120 watts maximum output, which is more than enough for this unit right here, even if we do set a much higher power limit, which I'll be doing in this video, as I said. It comes in this space gray. Along the front here, we have four microphones. This is USB 3.2 type A, so that's 10 gigabits per second. The type C port here, that's 10 gigabits per second. Data only does not support power delivery or video out. 3.5 millimeter audio jack, that's the clear CMOS, and that's very handy if you get the RAM timings wrong. Uh, in the video, I might have said that you need to remove the battery. In fact, you can just use that there, so it's a bit easier. Power on button with status, LED. And then along the back, we have our exit vent. This is where the hot air is gonna come out of. Our DCN for power. Now, this USB is USB, and it's 4.0, so that's good. It's 40 gigabits per second. And then we have USB 2 port right here, which I wish wasn't there, but for a mouse, that's still fine. Not gonna be a problem. And this is another USB 2 right there. That is USB 3.2, 10 gigabits, gigabits per second. 2.5 gigabit LAN port. So again, we, we're getting some good speeds here. We're seeing with previous models from them. So that is good. And we have DisplayPort 1.4. That's 4K 120 hertz. That's that one there, of course. HDMI, and that's 4K 120 hertz too. So HDMI 2.1. And finally, a 3.5 millimeter Audio jack, again, there's one at the front, there's one at the rear here. So for ports, very good. Either side, there's nothing. That's just metal there. And the top, we have the B-Link logo. And I think it looks good. Then on the bottom, a vent. And you've got these little rubber tabs that you need to remove if you want to gain access to the internals, which I'll show you now. Now those rubber tabs are stuck in place, so they were a little annoying to get off. But once you've done that, you have a little rub rubber tab here to pull on, and then that lid comes off. And we have a dust filter here. So this is good and it's bad in one way because it just means we have more things to remove to gain access to the internals, but I'd rather have this protection. So this is where you can just wipe off the dust and pull this off for regular maintenance. There is a ribbon cable here. You have to be very careful with those internal speakers there. We've got this SSD cooler, which is great to have. And I'll just lift that up now. You see that there are two thermal pads there applying contact. We've got our two 22 by 80 MVME, so we have our PCIe 4.0 SSD slots there, and you've got your Wi-Fi card that you can upgrade. Now, it's only Wi-Fi 6, um, it's the 2230 size, so you could swap this out and put a Wi-Fi 7 in card in later on. So these are the only upgrades that we have. That's it. There's nothing else, okay, because the RAM is soldered onto the board. That's why it's so fast at the 7500 mega transfers instead of... 5600 but we're stuck of course at 32 gigabytes of ram and i won't go any further because i don't want to disturb the thermal compound or thermal paste but they have a vapor chamber in there and quite a large cooler you can kind of see it through the sides it's a little hard but it's quite a bit of work to get to and as i mentioned i don't want to damage anything and we'll see what the results are the thermals out of the factory too just to point out that the build quality is excellent. They've got that black PCB. It's a quality PCB. It's nice and thick. It's not thin. You've got some of the ribbon cables are screwed into place. Our wireless antennas 
are located here, so it's on the bottom to help improve the signal strength. Overall looks very good. I really cannot fault them. B-Link's build quality, I think, is excellent in the components they've used. It's a crucial SSD too that is in there, so it's all brand components as well. So this part is a little bit boring, it's a bit technical, and this is just for advanced users that want to get the absolute best. Now, your mileage may vary from chipset to chipset to the RAM chips, okay? So we don't really know, but I think in general, most of these should work these settings. So first we're gonna go into the advanced tab of the BIOS. Now in order to get into the BIOS, you hit delete when it boots. Just keep tapping, smashing delete until you get to the main screen right there. So we wanna tweak the RAM because this is where we can really gain a bit of performance, especially for that Radeon 890M. So AM DCBS. You want to go to the UMC common options. Now you need to go to the RAM integrated, well embedded should I say RAM options here that we have and you need to go to timing configuration. Arrow down and hit accept. Now we want to change the auto setting which by default is 7500 mega transfers. So we want to put that onto enable and the maximum speed instead of the default there it is put this to the 8,000 mega transfers, and that should work on everyone's unit, I hope, unless they change the RAM chips, but it should be fine. You can always hit the clear CMOS button next to the power there if you run into any issues, you won't permanently damage this. So you wanna tweak the timings. This is an important one if you wanna go from a cast latency of 27, 26, to then 22. Find this one, TCL, control and hit manual, then change eight, because that will never work, eight is way too much. The lowest and the best I've been able to get to work is this, where it's stability and good timing, 16. And this is gonna give us an end result of a cast latency of 22, which is extremely good considering the speeds we're running. And no other settings here need to be touched. And you just keep hitting escape to get back. Now we wanna go into maybe this option, MB IO common options. You can change graphics configuration to the dedicated RAM assigned to that Radeon 890M. Now you can put this to eight, which I think is good for a game. So if you're gonna game, you wanna keep that on eight, 16 and 24, not recommended. You will run into stability issues. Trust me on that one. So escape again. Now we go on to the overclocking part here. We've overclocked the RAM. Now we're gonna overclock both the GPU and the CPU side of things. So AMD overclocking, accept. And we're also gonna tweak up the power limit. So we need to go here to precision boost overdrive. And you wanna set this here to advanced. And we want to go to the PBO limits. This is our power limits, okay? So put this to manual. You wanna to go to the PPT limit. And we want to enter in what I found is good is 80 watts, which is 80, and then add the three zeros to the end, okay? We don't wanna to touch the current limits here for the VRMs, okay, VRMs, we don't wanna cook them or anything, so just leave that. Precision boost, overdrive. Now, we can tweak around with that, but not really needed or recommended. CPU boost, so we can enable this to positive. Now, it's only 25 megahertz here, so let's make this the maximum, 200 and it's gonna work. GPU boost, make this 200, and that is also going to work. So we just overclocked slightly the CPU and our GPU now. Cinebench R23, so let's start out with that benchmark that a lot of people do like. So I managed to get here, you can see a score that is, I think is really impressive. So 2000 single core and 20,000, in fact, I can do better than that. I can probably do about uh, 23,000 now with some of the further tweaks that I've been doing. So looking at our benchmarks, I'll start out here with uh, the base Geekbench that I got. So I can probably get a little bit higher than this, but this is a phenomenal score, almost 3,000 on the single core. Again, remember this is with the RAM tweaks, with the slight overclocking that I've done, just getting the absolute best out of this particular mini PC. So a stock, core, stock score, this is time spy, without any of the overclocks or tweaks, okay? This is out of the box. You're gonna get around 4,000, which is very good out of this chipset HX 370. But when I show you the difference, look at this. 
I've managed to increase it by quite a large sum there, as you can see. So I've taken the graphics score up to well over 3,800 now. The CPU score is now over 11,000 and results and mileage will vary uh, because not all people will be able to run these RAND timings, but I think most will be able to definitely run that power limit and the overclocks shouldn't be a problem either uh, with my experience with this chipset. So you can see I've just put a few notes there that is definitely this, the B-Link and the RAM timings a tweak. For anyone that's interested in that, Fire Strike, I can actually do better than this. I should be able to reach a graphics score here of well over 10,000 now, which is impressive for internal graphics. Very, very good here. And if you're wondering the OpenCL score with Geekbench 6, well, that is it right there. So great performance after all of those tweaks. It just shows you that uh, a little tiny bit of overclocking, you can really squeeze quite a bit out of this particular chipset. Video playback using HEVC codec and VP9 and everything was all good. So for a media playback device, flawless, really good performance, better than Media Lake and maybe even Lunar Lake too. Really excellent with this. And then I decided to check out YouTube as well, VP9 decoding with Chrome. And at the start, when I resized the screen, it dropped a couple of frames. But from then onwards, it was pretty much rock solid at 4K 60. So very good performance for video. I've been saying this for a while now that gone are the days that you need a dedicated GPU in order to edit 4K video with Adobe Premiere Pro. The integrated graphics, that Radeon 890M does accelerate everything and you can see it in use at the moment now. And the performance is excellent. The timeline's great, even with basic edits, it's still fine. And export time, really good. About 20 seconds for one minute of footage encoded at 4K with the YouTube preset. That's just a little bit slower than the Intel chipsets. Like Media Lake can do it at around 24 seconds, but of course it has Intel's Quick Sync, which aids the performance. Here we don't have that, but still amazing performance for video editing, the integrated graphics. Finally, onto that gaming performance, the 1080p with Cyberpunk 2077. Now for the graphics preset, I did set it to the low setting, but I turned off frame generation and resolution scaling. I didn't want any of that stuff that helps to artificially boost the frame rate. I wanted to see the raw performance and ran the benchmark, of course, the in-game one. And the performance turned out to be quite a surprise for me. We got a very solid 50 three frames per second average. Remember that's 1080p, there's no frame generation on, and this is integrated graphics. Very good, I'm quite amazed by this result. Then actual gameplay, we're looking at close to 50 frames per second here, 49 at the moment, but I do wanna pick a fight with someone because often that's when the frame rate is gonna really suffer. Where it'll dip down. Okay, I can see some guys right here, so. Let's blast them. And we're still at 50. We're at 51, 52 frames per second. And considering with the fact that it's got no FSR on, any of those tricks to boost the frame rate, this is really impressive performance. So that power limit increase, RAM overclock definitely helped, and the slide overclock on the GPU too. Still getting that really good frame rate. Taking out those bots there. So it doesn't really get much better than this for end of 2024 integrated graphics, I think. Next up, Shadow of the Tomb Raider 1080p. This is on the highest preset that I decided to use here. Now you can put it on low, that'll give you a slight boost in the frames per second. But even so, we managed to get 46 frames per second average 1080p with integrated graphics and the high preset remember that one so really good performance i think this is the best yet i've seen out of integrated graphics then assassin's creed valhalla again 1080p all the games that we're going to be testing are all 1080p and i used the high preset again just to push it really hard to see what it was capable of and this warranted a 41 frames per second average. Now, of course, lower that down to the low preset and you're gonna get a much better, more playable frame rate. The Witcher 3 here performed extremely well. I have not seen integrated graphics this good at 1080p and this is the lowest preset and it's around 60 frames per second. It dips down into the lower 50s, but extremely playable. 
So that R DNA 3.5, yeah, fantastic. And Strix point, Strix point that we got here, really impressive. And I can't wait to see this chip or something similar in gaming handhelds, hopefully coming very soon. Surely there has to be a downside, right? The thermals must be out of control. Fan noise must be insane. Well, it doesn't go over 90 degrees, 90.1 was always sort of cap out about there. Yes, thermal throttling started to happen around about 86 to 90, but it didn't surpass that. And the fan noise is excellent. Often when you're using it, it is just super quiet and you only really hear it when you push it really hard gaming or running Cinebench or something. And speaking of which, I'll run Cinebench now. And what you're gonna hear is the fans worst case scenario what it sounds like and I think overall excellent fan noise from this SER9. Linux support is good with this. I did test out Linux Manjaro with open source drivers, one of the latest builds. And if you've got a keen eye, you'd see, even though the text is very small, I am running Geekbench here and I'll show you that result. The multi-core score was about the same as Windows, but the single core score performance is quite a bit less. We're talking about 800 points less, and I don't know the reasoning behind this, but that's just what it is, the result I got, and I thought I'd show you that. So fantastic performance from the RDNA 3.5 with the 12 cores now, and especially with the RAM timing tweaks, RAM overclocking, and increased power limit, we're reaching close to the 4,000 GPU score point with Firestrike and getting gaming performance in titles as I showed you, like Witcher, The Witcher 3, close to 60 frames per second at 1080p, on integrated graphics, something this small seems unbelievable. Now, the tweaks that I showed you, they may not work for everyone, and it's probably down to the RAM chips, so you might not be able to run the faster timings, the power limit should not be a problem, the cooling can handle it, and if it doesn't boot, it doesn't post, then get yourself a SIM tool and find the little CMOS reset little hole, push it in there and you reset it and it'll boot again and have another try and try and get the best results as you can and let me know in the comments how you get on. But of course that's not for everyone. So is this mini PC one of the best? It certainly is out of all of the ones that I have covered. From the performance we get, fantastic. But there are two things that I have discovered. One is the obvious, the price. It's about a thousand US dollars, 905 or so euros. I think it's too pricey considering what you're getting. It's 32 gigabytes of RAM, which cannot be upgraded. And the other thing I discovered is whenever I try to run an eGPU, and this is like a Thunderbolt 3 or Thunderbolt 4 eGPU setup, but with the Type-C put on the rear, which is the Thunderbolt 4, uh, it crashes eventually the whole thing just reboots. And I can run the same eGPU on other mini PCs and other laptops, and I have no issues. So there seems to be a bit of a problem with this unit. Hopefully B-Link are aware of this, I will let them know, and they have a BIOS update or some sort of fix to stop that. But other than that, what a mini PC, what a chipset of course too from AMD. So thanks a lot for watching this review. A little long I know, but I went into a bit of extra detail for this one of the B-Link Sir 9.